thank you all very much for coming this lunchtime. Uh, for those of you I haven't met before, my name is Tom Keating and I run here at RUCR Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies. Um, just over a year ago, actually, we had the pleasure of hearing uh, from David Green, who at that time was the outgoing uh, director of the Serious Fraud Office. Um, I think it was more of a kind of retrospective on his six years, I think it was, that he uh, was at the helm at the uh, the SFO. So we're really delighted to uh, welcome Lisa Osowski today, uh, the new director, or since uh, August, I think, last year, director of the Serious um, Fraud Office. Uh, Lisa gamely uh, took her speech to the Cambridge Economic Crime Symposium. I don't think you've been in the, the job for very long when you stood up in front of that crowd in in Cambridge and Sunshine and talked about some of the kind of ambitions you had and some of the experience you had that you hope to bring to the SFO. So we hope to hear uh, today uh, from Lisa, you know, not, not quite a year into the, the job. Um, you know, the title uh, of today's talk is Fighting Fraud and Corruption in a Shrinking uh, World. I think uh, you have biographies um, of Lisa. I always like to look through these things and and uh, see where my life might have intersected with uh, our speakers before. Um, so I was disappointed to see that uh, Lisa had worked at Goldman Sachs, myself having worked at JP Morgan for 20 years, arch rival. Um, but uh, as their money laundering reporting officer, you clearly kept them out of, uh, out of trouble um, there. And uh, more recently, he's been working for Exeger um, here in, in London on, on various uh, advisory projects, which may get uh, referred to. I should say that uh, Lisa's remarks will be uh, on the record, seeing Coase here in the front row reminds me, I need to say that when there's a journalist in the front row. Um, uh, but the Q&A will be off the record, so please take advantage of uh, the Q&A opportunity uh, that will form the second half um, of the discussion. Two um, small admin items. Uh, I don't believe there's a fire, going to be a fire alarm, but you never know uh, in a building that's um, as old as this. Uh, and uh, please make sure your telephone is off. There's enough craziness going out on Whitehall at the moment. Uh, we should enjoy some peace and quiet in here for uh, an hour. So with that, uh, Lisa, I will pass the microphone to you. Thank you very much uh, for making the, the trip today all the way from the SFO. Uh, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thanks. I think it actually was three days since I was in post, but who was counting, and I think I'm exactly seven months from that speech um, into the job so far. But again, who's counting? Um, you're close. Not qu definitely not quite a year. In fact, I was just, just over half a year. Anyway, I'm very honored to be at this prestigious and influential institute, which has contributed so many worthy um, um, contributions to issues regarding international security and our understanding about defense and threats. I also applaud the work of the Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies. They're especially um, focusing on areas near and dear to my heart as someone whose job it is to focus on economic crime and the threat that it poses to our country and across the globe, especially their focus on the work that the public and private sector do to disrupt that sort of crime is work that I'm particularly interested in, and I think it's key to tackling the issue. Um, I know the people in this room are people who understand the damage that fraud and money laundering and corruption do to our society and to our citizens both, well, often in some of the poorest parts of the world, but indeed just in our own backyard and to our own economy as well. But we also understand the sorts of damage it does to democracy and to the rule of law, and I know you're with me in that. I know you also understand the scale of the challenge that law enforcement faces in combating these sorts of crimes, and also how quickly the landscape changes with the advent of new technology. And that, again, is another challenge to us, and I know you wish us well in that, in that challenge. Um, our remit as the Serious Fraud Office is to investigate and prosecute the most complicated and difficult kinds of fraud and corruption. We focus on the cases with great harm and complexity, and those are the cases that we focus on that undermine our markets 
and our economy. And unusually for UK law enforcement, because it's just not common here, we're uniquely situated in this way, we manage ourselves in interdisciplinary teams. So we've got investigators, prosecutors, forensic accountants, and other specialists working on our cases from inception or take on through to prosecution and appeal. This last bit is crucial because, well, our cases can take a long time, too long, some might say, and I will get onto that later, but can you imagine how much more clunky and laborious our ca- our cases would be if we didn't have all the right skill sets sitting at the table together, working hand in hand from beginning through to end. In fact, I've recently updated my statement of principle, which guides my on-take focus when I'm looking at a potential new investigation to state specifically that we're going to take the cases on that require our unique multidisciplinary structure and approach. So as I say, seven months to the day since I've been been in the job in the job and you've kindly noted I, I did I did mention a few of the themes that I imagined I'd be facing and now I think it's actually a good time f- to reflect myself and and with your indulgence with you as well on the the sorts of themes I thought that I would be facing and to to give you a feel for what we've done so far to engage and to work on these areas that I thought were critical and in fact have proven to be so. These include engagement and partnership, building our capabilities, especially in the intel area and in terms of technology, and exploiting the new tools we've been given either by government or through the advent of um, law enforcement networks to gain efficiencies at every stage of our operation. So I'm going to first start with our partnerships. As we all know, the increasingly transnational nature of serious economic crime, including the ease and speed with which criminals move money across borders, means that we're facing a situation where criminals are able to hide their money in far reaches of the globe faster and more efficiently than ever before. And it makes us in law enforcement have a much higher challenge in terms of tracing and detecting that crime in our shrinking world. So we've got a double challenge to law enforcement. First of all, we've got to cooperate more effectively across the different jurisdictions where the crime will pass. And secondly, we're doing it in a situation where the quantity of data is rising exponentially. So we're going to need technical solutions to technological hurdles. And of course, it's not law enforcement alone that is an area in which uh, nation states, whatever advantages and merits they may yield, but can struggle to marshal an effective response to the challenges of globalization. But I'd argue at least that when we talk about law enforcement, we do have some fairly strong cards. And the first is that people in my industry, in our, if, it's, if it's many of you out there who are also in law enforcement in our industry face, is that we've got a common mission. We are or can become natural allies, not competitors. All of us are geared to the same goal of making our world a better, more secure one, in part by putting in jail those criminals who are disrupting and making our world an unsafe place. Now, I I acknowledge there are significant barriers uh, to cooperation. In some countries, working with those who are reputed to be law enforcement can be dangerous. It can mean that your case is, it can, can suffer damage or, in fact, uh, in, in investigations can be jeopardized, witnesses can be threatened, there can even be human rights abuses. But in, and in entirely trustworthy jurisdictions, there are also times when issues about primacy and sovereignty can pose hurdling blocks. Even when these are overcome, there are differences in the rules of engagement and national law and procedure, and those can also limit the way we cooperate if we let them. So it's up to us 
in my field to understand the differences across the different jurisdictions and to understand those differences and how they're embedded in the different nations' legal systems. Remember, cases are often reported to multiple authorities and regulators. Sometimes it's the press who gets there first and the case is out there for all to see. Corporate entities, on the other hand, want some clarity and some understanding about who they may be. They want to cooperate. They want to know who to cooperate with and how trustworthy the, the recipient of their information might be. So there can be and are weighty differences in how different countries' laws protect their citizens. Countries deeply committed to, um, to, to human rights and the rule of law and expunging corruption can have very, very different rules in terms of how to do it. So I'm going to give you one example, the right to silence. In this country, if a defendant exercises his or her right to silence, we can make an adverse, we may be able to make an adverse comment on it in court. This would be heresy in the U.S., where the U.S. Constitution, the Fifth Amendment, prohibits any mention of the exercise of that right. It's just one example, but there are many others, including ways that we deal with evidence and how evidence is obtained, how we disclose evidence to defendants in advance of trial, how our witness and defendant interviews got, or suspect interviews must be conducted, differences in the reach and recognition of corporate criminal liability, very different in this case. And I'm, I'm recused from, from one particular case where reporting restrictions still still apply, but many people in this field recognize that there are issues around corporate criminal liability that are surfacing and that our courts are still developing in a way this isn't really an issue in the U.S. at all where vicarious liability is in place. There's also differences in the way criminal dispositions are made and how we negotiate those, differences in private privacy laws. And this is just to name a few of the differences about which we need to be aware when our sisters in sister agencies or other law enforcement authorities in other parts of the world are looking at similar facts and addressing similar cases. Because we don't want to ruin each other's cases. We're here to work together, not to get in the way of, of how our, our other colleagues are working. So it's really easy to miss the differences and to think we're communicating when, in fact, we're talking past one another. I want to give you one example in this area. There's been an awful lot written recently about deferred prosecution agreements. And without getting into all the details now, but I'm happy to answer any questions, it's a mechanism that we've had since the Crime and Courts Act of 2013. The U.S. has had DPAs, or deferred prosecution agreements, since before our time. And it's been a bit of a wave across the world. French got it under Sap and Deux, the Argentinians got it, the Australians got it, Canadians just last fall were finally able to have their own DPA. So when we all sit down to work on cases together, and when we use the word DPA, we all think we're talking about the same thing. But actually, we're not. They're very different depending on which country you're using your DPA in. For example, in the U.S., it's the judiciary um, d can sit entirely outside the DPA process. There's something called a non-pros agreement or non-prosecution agreement. Judge doesn't get involved at all. So our U.S. colleagues are sometimes surprised at the critical role a judge will play in our DPA system, which is very much the case. Our DPAs don't go until a judge accepts them. And sometimes, again, the terminology that looks so appealingly similar actually can be quite, quite, can make for some interesting uh, talking past one another. I just want to note that last month the OECD published its study on resolving foreign bribery cases with non-trial resolutions. So anyone who's interested in this topic, I commend that report to you. It's quite interesting. Good read. But the way we're trying to overcome those barriers within my new organization is to build relationships with our colleagues in places from Argentina to Australia to Lithuania. And I only recently had the great honor of signing a, a working relationship, an MOU, with the Independent Authority Against Corruption of Mongolia. Now, this is one, just one way that we're doing our work to try to 
really speak the same language as some of our colleagues across the world. As I talk right now, we've got a U.S. prosecutor from DOJ sitting side by side, as, as close as Tom is, to my colleagues at the SFO, working on SFO cases together. So they're rolling up their sleeves together and focusing on casework and resolving cases as if he were one of us for the time being. He's a secondee um, for the next year. And we've also hosted others. It's not just I am from the U.S. originally, but it's not just my U.S. colleagues I like to, to work with. We've actually hosted people from Singapore and other places as well. And so you know, maintaining these kinds of close relationships and actually working together is really the the future for us, I think, in law enforcement. You know, we see criminals who, from the UK who rip off victims in Asia or who pay corrupt payments in Africa or who have money flow through the US in dollars. And we realize they actually do a pretty good job of working together. And we're not going to make the kinds of inroads we want to make unless we can work together appropriately. It's not just abro um, abroad that I care about. It's domestically as well and looking closer to home. I think about the kind of relationships we have with organizations like the FCA, who are more in the regulatory and enforcement space, or the NCA, the National Crime Association, or um, the MET police, the City of London police, HMRC, and others, where actually there's a lot we can do in casework together, and I'm always interested in collaborating, and I'm happy to report we've got some cases right now as I sit here, and I've been able to open some cases, even in the short time I've been there, where we're working hand-in-hand -hand with some of our local agencies, and that, that's a good thing. And I don't know how many of you have followed the opening of the National Economic Crime Center. It, came, it first came on board at the end of October of last year, and that's an organization that's meant to coordinate all of the local or more domestic authorities' work so we don't trip over each other. And so if I know an awful lot about one area, I'm put together with the other agencies that we can share information and work better together on our cases. Of course, it's not law enforcement alone that we need to work with. I know you'll recognize, and people from the center especially will have focused on the work of the private sector. And of course, we've already seen our government's commitment to that in setting up things like the joint, the GIMLET, the Joint Money Laundering. Um, I knew I was going to... Intelligence, exactly. Intelligence um, task force, the Gimlet. And, you know, that's been a huge success and trumpeted widely um, in terms of a public private partnership. The NEC, too, that I just described playing that coordinating role is also one where we are, we are seeing very much an effort to try to get the public and private together. And that's a good thing, I think. And obviously, the more we work together in not just uh, basic operational ways, but in strategic ways, the better we're going to do on the criminals. Um, but in terms of a true public-private sector partnership, that means something special in my role now at the SFO. One area of private sector that I've been asked about since I took on this job is the area of cooperation. And I know from my previous experience in the private sector how much time, effort, and resource companies and financial institutions spend on ensuring compliance with anti-money laundering laws and making sure that they have in place all of the, um, the, the infrastructure they need to defend against fraud and that they don't get caught up in a problem regarding prevention of, of either bribery or overseas tax evasion. They've got a lot of experience. They've got great analytical tools. And they've also have vast quantities of data that they should be willing, I'd argue indeed eager, to share with law enforcement. They've got, they may even have regulatory requirements that make them have to alert authorities to what they're learning, or they may be working already through a group like the Gimlet. But I want to go further. When a company detects fraud or corruption within its walls, I would hope that company would be brave enough to come to law enforcement as soon as possible. Now, don't misunderstand me. I know companies are going to want to explore potential areas of suspicion or possible regulatory breaches. 
that is totally normal. They've got shareholder duties to ensure that allegations are more than just allegations, that make sure they're investigated and assessed and verified so that they understand what they may be reporting before they report it. And they'll probably bring in independent advisors to carry out these investigations, and that's a prerogative and it's entirely proper. But if they want all that hard work to count as cooperation, there's certain steps they're going to have to take. They've got to carry out their mission with an idea to preserving evidence and preserving really important firsthand accounts and witness testimony. That's different from when a company calls in a team of lawyers and investigators and blankets the whole thing in legal professional privilege over all the material they've gathered especially if that's material that we in law enforcement need to determine whether we have culpable individuals, which, by the way, is the same material those very individuals are going to need if they've got to defend themselves in court later. And I'm talking specifically about first accounts and witness testimony. That's not cooperation. Our courts don't like it, and it doesn't help law enforcement. It doesn't help us with our job of dispensing justice fairly. So of course, legal, priv legal professional privilege is what it says. It's a privilege afforded to attorney-client communications. And though I don't sound like Rumpel the Bailey, and I certainly hope I don't look anything like Rumpel of the Bailey, I am a quali I'm qualified in this jurisdiction as a barrister. I understand the importance of the privilege. I grew up in a system in the U.S. where that privilege is in some ways stronger even than it is here. It's a central tenet of our legal system. But if companies want credit for cooperating with us, they've got to think long and hard about waiving that privilege. I'm soon going to be issuing guidance for the corporates and the financial institutions and their legal advisors to provide them with some added transparency about what they can expect when they decide to self-report fraud or corruption to my office. And waiving privilege over those initial investigative materials are going to be a strong indicator to me of cooperation. And it's also going to send a signal that I should be thinking long and hard about offering or extending an invitation to engage in the deferred prosecution agreement process or negotiations with our office. And it also shows that it may well be in the public interest to engage in a DPA with this kind of company. And I say all this in light of the remarks that Sir Brian Levison made in the ENRC case. And I'm going to quote, basically, a court will consider whether the company was willing to waive any privilege attaching to documents produced during internal investigations so that it could share these documents with the SFO. The president of the Queen's Bench has spoken and we're in a jurisdiction where that judge and the judges play a very critical role in our DPA process, I think it behooves us all to listen and to take heed. I'm going to move on to technology. And of course, it's easy to say, but harder to do. Um, as crime becomes more digital, so must we. In law enforcement, we've got to increase our capabilities in this area. Of course, when I started prosecuting, Many moons ago, most of the evidence in fraud cases especially was paper-based paper -based evidence. We had ledgers and accounts and all kinds of corporate documents that were in hard copy. And we no longer struggle to put our cases together, making sure we've got enough copies. In fact, today our communications are digital, our accounting records are digital, digital and suspects and witnesses that we come to either search or stop and see have incredible amounts of digital material just located in their pockets. So it's emails and social media and closed chat rooms and WhatsApp messages that really make up the bulk of the evidence that we at the SFO take in. In fact, we did a, a calculus and it's about 95% of the evidence that we're looking at is in that form and or it's electronically based. So as investigators now, we're trying to find evidential needles in enormous digital haystacks. 
And what that means for us is to be effective, we've got to understand the digital world, and that means new tools. So one of the things we're doing at the SFO is we've developed some artificial intelligence tools that we're experimenting with and we're using to help us get to more critical evidence in a quicker manner. We're also using forensic computer expertise, and among the disciplinary and the multidisciplinary teams I described, we're, for, we're, we're doing a lot of training and hiring around our forensic digital abilities. And this isn't just a challenge for us. It's actually a challenge for law enforcement around the globe. And I, as, as me and, and investigators I work with travel the globe, we note that it's almost every jurisdiction where we work that they're facing the same issue. All the agencies are investing in training forensic personnel. The agencies are investing in hardware and software. Every agency is coping with the sheer volume of high-capacity devices involved in almost every sophisticated case. And each of us wants to know what's working for each other. How can we learn from each other? Um, just now, my chief technology officer just got back from a trip to New York and Washington, where he spent time looking at the systems that the other authorities are using to see what sorts of tools and techniques are going to be applicable to us. What, what, of the, what, what they're doing, you know, what can we do like them, or how can we modify our systems to work better based on what we're seeing around the globe. But of course, despite all these new challenges and this great new technology, our courts are good, old-fashioned systems, and they've got, to repl uh, they've got to apply good, reliable doctrine in areas like disclosure, discovery, and authentication of evidence. Of course, it's not the first time our courts have had to deal with new technology. When the telephone came into effect, you know, that was the cutting edge in communications technology. But now I feel we're at an inflection point, and the evidential ramifications of how digital information is gathered and how it's used in court is something that defense lawyers use to wrestle with us in every single case we face. So part of the future of fighting crime and corruption is technology, the hardware, the software, the training, and the litigating evidence from the new world so that we can get it into our more established court systems appropriately. Just a quick word, if you will, on a couple of the new tools our government has given us. We, we, we appreciate, obviously, the fact that we're in a financial hub and a financial center, and our, our government has responded most recently to some criticisms that were levied at our financial system by giving us the Criminal Justice Criminal Finances Act of 2017. And one of the most helpful areas, the one that gets a lot of press, is the, the unexplained wealth order. You probably read, like I did with kind of interest, the Harrods woman who had a sort of 20, 20 million a year shopping habit. It involved a lot of nice jewelry. and But the other areas of that law are really helpful to us, including one that allows us to take assets and money off of offenders. And we just used it to great advantage last month, our proceeds of crime team actually took $1.5 million off a guy who had been involved in a mortgage fraud here in our jurisdiction in the UK. He fled to Pakistan quite a while ago, and a receiver was in charge of the property he had used. He, had, he, he used his criminal activity to buy some property. The mortgage fraud scheme led to him buying property. The property was sold. It now sat with a receiver in an account, and we were able to forfeit that money and get the money back. And what that importantly means is not only does the Treasury get an extra $1.5 million, but an organized crime gang will have $1.5 less to either fund a lavish lifestyle or typically pump into committing further and detrimental crime. So this is a great win for me and a really important way we can use the new tools government's given us. I promised I'd get to the point about efficiency and pace. We've got to do this all at a better pace. When I arrived seven months ago, I think the one thing I heard from more consistently from more stakeholders, including partners and, and uh 
even our super, superintending law officers, was that our cases take too long. And for any of you who have followed recently the, the House of Lords Select Committee on Bribery Act 2010, they actually one of the recommendations was for the SFO to outline ways that we were gonna speed up our corruption cases. So I just wanna make one thing clear. Our cases are always gonna take a while based on their nature and based on the fact that we are getting evidence from the furthest reaches of the globe. That just takes time. And often, our cases are long and complex. We've got multiple defendants. What does that mean? It means it's a burden on our court system to schedule the amount of court time we need to manage these longer, more complicated, multiple defendant cases. So it's not unusual for us to have to wait up to 18 months to actually get court time. Think of that built into the case. I mean, these are things... I recognize, and we can't do anything about it. But of course, there are things we can do to reduce delay. The better international cooperation means I get my evidence faster. If I cooperate better with intelligence, whether it's domestic or overseas, I ought to be able to cut off lines of inquiry and get to the really the heart of the matter sooner rather than later and get my key evidence, and our teams get their key evidence when we need it, and better technology ought to reduce the delay that it takes to wade through the kind of evidence that we're looking at in terms of the digital records. We're also exploring other ways that we can, for example, looking at our information infrastructure to make sure that our processes don't create unnecessary frictions and that we are doing things in the most focused way that we can. But you know, at the end of the day, the prosecutor's bread and butter and you know, the bedrock of being a prosecutor is a relentless focus on evidence. And where and in what form that evidence may be found can change. Because our world is shrinking and shrunk, the evidence can be in any continent. And because our world's digital, it may be in bytes. In fact, it's most likely in bytes rather than in a piece of paper in a top drawer somewhere. And also because, you know, all, as all these things are going on, you know, we, we've, got, we've got the new tools that we've discussed, but we frankly, we've got to rely on our old-fashioned craft. And that's all about proper investigative planning, rigorous case management, and persuasive advocacy. That's, that's what we do, and that's, what we, what, what, that's our mission. So what's the future of fighting fraud and corruption in a shrinking world. First, the inter old school interdisciplinary teams I talked about. I say old school because that's how I learned to work cases in Chicago. We always had multiple agencies and agents sitting together next to the prosecutors. And having all those skills together, as I mentioned before, I think is really the way to get at the criminals who are who are trying to cheat us out of, out of basically uh, to lie, cheat, and steal. So I think having those teams are important. Also, the future is using new technology. As I've discussed earlier, you know, when the criminals started using telephones, law enforcement kept up. Criminals are now using iPads and WhatsApp and chat rooms and the cloud and emails, and law enforcement has to keep up. And our courts do too. The future is also mutually beneficial cooperation. So I'm going to finish where I started. Um, there's a community, I think some of you are represented here, made of public and private actors, as well as those in the academy and civil service, that really cares deeply about the damage that fraud and money laundering and corruption do to our society. Organized criminals exploit gaps, and they, they're very quick to embrace new technology, and they certainly don't feel hamstrung by the legal norms that we operate under. So it's up to us, the collective group that cares about this, to close the gaps and respond more quickly and to work together to dismantle the criminality that causes such harm to our economy, our prosperity and to the lives of victims. And I look forward to working with you to meet this enormous challenge. It, it, it always has been and still remains very worthwhile. So thank you very much. Thank you.